Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Rath Wang. Tensions between China and the Philippines reach a new high as the Chinese Coast Guard severely damaged a Philippine resupply vessel by firing water cannons at it eight times around the Ayugan Shoal in the South China Sea. This comes just two days after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's Manila visit, where he declared U.S. ironclad commitment to defending the Philippines. Joining us today are William Stanton, former American Institute in Taiwan AIT director, retired senior U.S. diplomat, Vincent Chow, Taipei City Councilor for the DPP and former DPP International Affairs Department director. A very warm welcome to both on the show today. Thank you. In light of this, President Marcos Jr. responded last Thursday by vowing to, quote, we will implement countermeasures against illegal, coercive, aggressive, and dangerous attacks by the Chinese Coast Guard. Bill, what form of countermeasures can we expect from the Philippines? Well, I agree with uh, the sentiments, the attitude of the Filipinos, enough is enough, we should. But unfortunately, uh, the, the fact is that China now has the largest navy in the world in terms of combat ships, and of course they've militarized their fishing fleet as well. And it's standard practice for them to uh, fire water cannons, to uh, shine laser lights. Um, and, you know, it's hard to see from a practical, realistic point of view what it is the Philippines can do as a countermeasure. I suppose they could get their own water cannons and uh, fire back. But, um, you know, any escalation is probably a, a risky proposition. What I'm a little bit hopeful for, about is that there will be, uh, on I believe April 11th, there'll be a trilateral meeting in Washington. And maybe, um, you know, Marcos and uh, Kishida and President Biden can figure out some way uh, to alter the current uh, downward spiral that we see between the, the Chinese and the Filipinos. So. Indeed, bringing more partners in to mediate. Yeah. Well, what about you, Vincent? What, what, what do you think? Do you feel I, that hmm. enough is enough on the Philippine side? Or, or? I, I agree with Bill completely. So the Philippines are going to be capability limited. Um, I think there are limits to what the Filipino Coast Guard and Navy could do short of direct escalation. And direct escalation, you know, would probably be at this point what the PLA wants to see, uh, because then this would further justify uh, their attempts to uh, further militarize the South China Sea and, and also assert more aggressively their maritime claims, which are legal in the international law in the area. So I think what we're going to see from the Philippines is a continued deepening of relations, not only with the United States, but also with Japan. And I think as part of that, um, Taiwan-Filipino relations could also benefit greatly. I mean, we saw, for example, the initial congratulatory letter um, that the Filipino president had extended to President like Lai Ching the first time ever. Uh, we see, for example, uh, the talks, as uh, Bill had referred to, that are soon going to take place uh, together with Japan. And we see, for example, this uh, forward uh, basing, or this, um, at least this rotation agreement that the Filipinos have with the United States now, uh, particularly in uh, Luzon, which, as you may understand, would have a critical part to play in any cross-strait contingency. So I think what the Chinese are doing is further driving the Filipinos away uh, from that relationship and further into, I would say, um, a, re a closer relationship with the U.S. and other democratic-like-minded partners. And ultimately, I think that's the act these are the actions that the Filipinos could take that would hurt Beijing and, I think, be much more effective in the long run um, than, for example, counter having retaliation or countermeasures uh, unilaterally. So do you feel those are just a play of words? Do you feel that those countermeasures or actually the strengthening of alliances, Bill, what do you think? No, I think that it has a real import if uh, uh, Beijing realizes that what it's doing is proving counterproductive because it's just creating a stronger alliance among democratic uh, partners. Um, I think the most important thing probably now is I was seeing, looking at a paper the other day written back in 2014 about a confrontation between China and Japan. And this was a Brookings Institution paper, and they said what we really need is a freeze. And I would think that, you know, ideally the best we can do right now is to ensure the situation doesn't get any worse and ask the Chinese to restrain themselves um, and their actions. 
Going back to international law, as Vincent mentioned earlier, um, the International Permanent Court of Arbitration ruled in favor of the Philippines in 2016 when it comes to these disputed waters. We've also seen over 21 countries, including the U.S., Japan, many in Europe, and more recently, even India, have voiced support for the Philippines. Vincent, how can the Philippines leverage the support? I know you talked a bit about diplomacy and about Philippines bringing other U.S. alliances or ally partners in. So this ruling was in 2016, and essentially what it did was it invalidated um, the PRC's claims in the area uh, that stemmed from this 11-line um, this um, that the ROC government had and extended to a 9-dash line. And I mean, to be clear, whether it was 11-dash or 9-dash line, or, or lines, both of these, um, I would say, maritime claims are in contravention of UNCLOS, which the PRC did sign, um, as well as um, international norms and international practices. But why? Um, because essentially they include maritime, uh, the maritime waters. I mean, that's the key part. Because, for example, we have our own claims in the region, but our claims are based on maritime features. So we claim the features and we ex claim the extended rights that extend beyond them. We don't claim the waters themselves, despite being in, for example, our 9 dash line or, or 11 dash line back in the day. Now, I guess the key point with the Philippines right now is how do you enforce a ruling, right? And the short answer is you can't. Um, you, you simply can't. I mean, the only way you could really do it is by kicking a PRC out, which, you know, it's not possible, I think, in, in, or feasible in, in either the short to medium term. But I think ultimately what um, the Filipinos have been quite smart to do um, is, is leverage that into further cooperation with the United States and other like-minded countries. So we're seeing, for example, greater freedom of navigation exercises um, in the region. We're seeing, for example, European countries together with Canada, with the United States and other democracies, you know, help assert sort of international uh, maritime rights in the region and challenge um, the PRC's, uh, I would say, annexation of certain areas. So I think what the Filipinos would probably continue to do is, is, is to do what I mentioned, which is not to do things unilaterally, but to work in close conjunction with international friends and partners to ensure that at least there's pushback. And I mean, one thing we have to make clear as well, which is the U.S., I mean, Filipino Mutual Self-Defense Treaty, it, it applies, you know, precisely and explicitly to uh, any armed attacks against uh, Filipino forces in the South China Sea as well, which is why we see water cannons instead of, for example, machine guns. But it was expanded recently to include the Coast Guard and all other attacks. That's right. But, I mean, the key is armed, right? So I think the Chinese are trying very hard to fall below that threshold of armed attacks. And I think that, I think, creates further room for the Filipinos, um, Filipino Coast Guard as well as the United States to push back against Chinese assertions in area. Do you think um, in terms of our claims, it's interesting you mentioned yeah. Taiwan's claims as well, you know, from the 9-dash line to the... Well, the 11-dash line. <laughs> to yeah. the 11-dash line. And, um, but why don't we see disputes as we've seen China and the Philippines? Is that because we're both democracies? What do you think brings this peace between our two countries? So we have to understand, I mean, there's a lot of claimants in, in, the, in the area, right? I mean, we, we actually do hold um, substantive control over two major islands, which are Taiping Island as well as Dongsa Island. And I think countries have respected that um, as, just as how we've respected sort of other countries that may have had their own features or, or built up um, bases, uh, not bases, but at least, you know, um, maritime claims. Uh, sort of. And I think the key idea is this, Rath, is that because there's so many claims, because it's such, you know, a hotbed of activity, because there's such a possibility of, you know, of clashes, misunderstandings, accidents taking place, every country so far in the past has been quite careful about how that relationship is managed and how their claims are managed. Careful until Beijing. So Beijing has upset that balance over the past decade. Uh, despite, you know, as you know, claims that they were not that were made to President Obama at the time. I think that was when Bill was working in the State Department. Yeah, we will not militarize the island. That's right. And so China has thrown a wrench into all of that, which is sort of been um, this environment of at least understanding and respect. And certainly that has caused the complications we see today. It's interesting Vincent mentioned how that balance has been appended by China, um, its recent actions. And Taiwan is also a target. How do you feel Taiwan can learn from this incident as we see the Philippines speaking up and, you know, allies of the Philippines, well, the U.S. and 
other democracies are coming to support. We have 21 countries now that have voiced support for the Philippines. Yeah, well, I think um, Taiwan is already, in a sense, a partner with the United States, with the Philippines, with other countries, because there's a uh, there's similar interests. Everybody has an interest in avoiding any kind of conflicts. Um, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, for example, we, we haven't been able to get a code of conduct for behavior. We haven't, you know, and that's because partly China has such enormous influence on certain ASEAN members like Myanmar and Cambodia and Laos who are indebted uh, to China or depend upon China for political support. What about bilateral agreements? Do you think that could be the way? Well, that would help. If you help. can't bring the whole ASEAN, then yeah, you could do it individually. Sure. If any agreements would help to, I think, uh, calm the situation. Um, if there were a number of bilateral agreements over time, you know, maybe they would cohere and there'd be a, a larger agreement. But right now, it's hard to see, um, you know, that happening anytime soon. I think the best thing is, as uh, Vincent has already been saying, is you know, uh, for Taiwan to identify with uh, stronger allies as the uh, Philippines is also doing. Uh, Taiwan, I know, already has a very good relationship with Japan. Um, I think they should you know, uh, expand that to whatever extent they can. And uh, likewise with the United States. And uh, it sounds like uh, certainly under President Biden, there's a great willingness to show more support for Taiwan. I, you know, I certainly put myself in the same camp that we, we need to do more to help Taiwan. Um, fortunately, one of the problems is that, um, you know, the Ukraine war, uh, we haven't delivered, uh, you know, in terms of uh, military support, we haven't even delivered all the weapons we should to, now to uh, Ukraine. And meanwhile, m billions of dollars worth of weapons to Taiwan have not yet been delivered either. So this is an ongoing struggle, and particularly given the divisions in the US Congress these days. So, um, but I think in the long run, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the United States will stand by Taiwan, the Philippines, other democratic uh, governments in the region. Speaking of the US, um, it seems that the Philippines, with or um, a certain amount of US support, but also on its own, um, has been very successful in internationalizing these disputes with China. Um, you were in the U.S., you led the political division there, and your main role or goal, I guess you could say, was to internationalize Taiwan so that people in America and around the world know about Taiwan's disputes, um, its international standing with China. So what do you think Taiwan can learn f from what the Philippines is doing or what you've already done in Washington? That's a very good point, Rath, actually. And I, I do see the similarities, which is these are all um, disputes that the PRC would prefer to see uh, domesticized or internalized, um, or at least in terms of bilateral uh, relationship in the case with the Philippines. And, and where, whereas it, it is actually in both of our interests in terms of Taiwan and the Philippines to really internationalize these challenges and to have as much international support as possible and for an international community to understand that this is not only regional but global implications. And so the similarities are there. Now in terms of what we can learn or do, I would say the key part is this, is that we really have to understand what, well, we have to be able to identify our friends and to identify our foes or challenges, challengers, so to say. And, and it's strategic ambiguity. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about the United States part, I'm talking about our own part. In, in terms, terms of, of who are our friends or who are that's right. our foes. It, it doesn't work. It didn't work under Duterte uh, when, when he was in power in the Philippines, when, for example, they said that, well, you know, we would look for a third way with Russia, with China. I mean, China used that, you know, opportunity or that chance uh, while the Filipinos were sort of distant with the United States to gobble up the South China Sea. And, and, and to assert all these claims that previously, I think they maybe did not have the confidence in doing so. And all of a sudden they received that confidence because the Filipinos were very, you know, they were ambiguous about who, who they wanted to, you know, see in terms of support and who they felt sort of kinship and affinity with. And I think, you know, this new um, administration in the Philippines has changed that. So we've seen a lot of strategic clarity, so to say, in terms of their relationship with the U.S., and with other democratic like-minded partners. And I think that's 
sort of the key takeaway for Taiwan is that is that we don't really stand to gain anything um, by saying that we're ambiguous and, and by saying that, well, maybe, you know, the PRC will have a change of heart. Maybe the PRC will all of a sudden have the good graces, you know. But to has allow Taiwan us. moved in that direction? Have we made clear who are our friends and who are our foes? I think what we've seen over the past decade or so certainly suggests that. I mean, we've seen this very real strengthening of our partnership with the United States, but also with Europe, with Japan, with Australia. I mean, we see this um, position that we've taken against the PRC, which is that, you know, we're not going to provoke, but neither are we going to back down from what we believe in and our values and interests. So I do think that this is the direction that this government has taken Taiwan over the past years, which is strategic clarity, for lack of a better word, in terms of who our partners and friends are. Despite international condemnation from over 21 countries of its actions, China's foreign ministry calls Philippine maritime activity an infringement on its sovereignty and rights, and for it to stop making provocations, while saying that the U.S. has no business in the South China Sea. What do you say to that, Bill? Well, it's always in China's interest, particularly when dealing with smaller nations in uh, East Asia, to say this is not an issue to be internationalized. But in fact, considering that 30 percent of the world's commercial trade goes through the South China Sea, much of that belongs to many nations around the world, including Europe has an interest, the United States has an interest. Um, it is an international issue because these are international waters. And the U.S. claim to interest is simply that we uh, want to preserve the right for all nations to be able to enter, leave, um, trade in, uh, international waters, and China is trying to make this in the South China Sea. So you're saying it, it's the same with the Taiwan Strait, make it an in international yes, water where anyone can pass? Where anyone can pass, the same way. And China wants to make this a bilateral issue. And it's not a bilateral issue, it's an issue of concern to everyone who wants open and free seas to be used by everyone. And there need to be international rules for that. So I think we have to counter and Taiwan needs to counter, we all need to counter that view that no, this is just a uh, China-Philippines issue or a bilateral issue. Uh, they wouldn't say bilateral, but an issue with Taiwan. These are issues that concern all the countries in the region and the world. Going back to Manila, Philippine National Security Council Assistant Director General Jonathan Malaya said on Saturday, quote, China is in for a rude surprise if it thinks it can intimidate Filipinos. Let's hear what he also has to say about China's actions. I think the support of the international community should send a signal to China that this is, the not, this is not the right path uh, to resolve these issues in the West Philippine Sea. Vincent, given that the Philippines seems to be more vocal these days and now they're involving the NSC, it, you worked at the NSC in Taiwan before. How significant is this? We have to understand the South China Sea issue in general, it's not just the foreign ministry issue. I mean, it, these are, it has implications you know, across the whole board of you know, security, you know, economic, trade, and all of these different other agencies. So I think you can see from um, the Filipino uh, government, um, the Philippines government, which is you know, the NSC has taken a role in this, and the NSC has coordinated not only a response, but also, um, you know, um, cooperation with the United States and other like-minded countries. And similarly, in Taiwan, I mean, the South China Sea issue is also dealt with at an NSC level. And, I mean, it's, it's an issue, again, that stretches across all these er different areas I talked about, but it's also a legal issue, right? Um, and so, certainly, I think, from Taiwan's perspective, you know, um, there is going to continue to be a whole-of-government approach to maintaining Taiwan's interests. Um, and, and certainly our sovereignty in, in, in the areas of the South China Sea, uh, which are important to us. Um, and I fully expect that uh, in years to come, you will continue to see actions that we will take to assert uh, our sort of um, control over Taiping Island, over Dongsa Island, and also to try to build these areas into places that are conducive uh, to regional peace and stability instead of challenges to it. For example, President Tsai Ing-wen has pledged that for Taiping Island, we'll try to uh, develop that into an area, a base for HADR activities, for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, so we can help, for example, um, maritime crews operating in an area. We can help, you know, fishing vessels to get stuck in an area. 
and so forth. And I think that's precisely the right approach to take, which is that Taiwan is a force for good. Uh, we do have our claims in the area, but we can certainly use the control that we have in the areas of the South China Sea we do control um, as a force for good and to be helpful for our neighbors in the region. It's great you mentioned President Tsai Ing-wen because there are calls within Taiwan for her to visit before she steps down. What do you say to that, apart from this humanitarian effort on Taiping Island, but having the president visit there, and what implications will this have on regional relations here? You know, I don't think it's consistent with what the international community would like to see at this point. I, and therefore, I don't think it is necessarily consistent with Taiwan's own national interests at this point either. I mean, certainly, this is a choice that you know, every president has had, um, ranging from Chen Shui-bian uh, to Ma ying and now to Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, but I ultimately think that, you know, President Tsai Ing-wen has been such a steady hand on all international affairs related issues, particularly in terms of being clear eyed on what our national interests are and how to best achieve them, that I have a hard time seeing um, how such a visit, which could inflame tensions with the region, particularly with what the PRC and the Philippines are going through right now, um, would be helpful for either. And, you know, we have our sovereignty there. We have a base there in Taiping Island. We have Marines and Coast Guard stationed in places in the South China Sea. I mean, there's no question that Taiwan under Tsai Ing-wen has asserted our sovereignty there. You know, is that necessarily um, beneficial if the president herself goes? You know, I would argue at this point, probably not. Uh, maybe this is a question for both of you, but um, Vincent worked at the NSC, and Bill, you've headed many um, leadership positions in terms of the U.S. De State Department, which works closely with um, American intelligence agencies. Do you feel Taiwan and Philippines in terms of um, NSA, is there any way they can work more? Because many analysts have talked, including on the show, that there's not enough um, official interaction between government agencies because of Taiwan's unique international position. Yeah, it's hard for me to say what's going on now. I think uh, in the past, I feel that what there was, you know, on the part of the U.S. government, there was uh, expanding uh, exchanges with Taiwan on many issues. Um, you know, I couldn't get. What about in. with the Philippines? Do you feel Taiwan and the Philippines could actually, actually talk more? In well, an sure. Capacity? I mean, I would support that, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it may be that one of the things I would hope would come out of perhaps the upcoming visit and the meeting in Washington, the trilateral meeting, is that between or among uh, the Philippines, uh, the United States, and Japan, there'll be greater coordination and cooperation. But it might be an opportunity as well um, through Taiwan's own diplomatic channels to suggest that they might have a role as well to play in this uh, in this group um, because uh, it's of concern to everyone in this area. So um, I would hope there'll be increased cooperation on all sides. The U.S. is both Taiwan and the Philippines' largest security partner. At a congressional hearing last month, Admiral John Aquilino, chief of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, raised an 11 billion U.S. dollar shortfall in the U.S. defense budget. Much of this funding is for resources to deter China from missile defenses to blind sea kill capabilities. Vincent, what does this mean for Taiwan and perhaps the Philippines as well, given that a lot of this is to deter what both countries see as a common threat? Well, you look at the U.S. $850 billion defense budget, and people have a hard time imagining there's a shortfall of anything in there. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that with the role that the United States plays in ensuring peace around the world, you know, the, there, there is, I guess, a real challenge there of resource allocation and just how much is enough. And also, I think particularly U.S. domestic sentiment says you guys face a huge you know, budget deficit. Um, and so I, I think all of these factors come into play. And I mean, these are precisely the reasons why we've seen politicians in the United States suggest that Ukraine should be deprioritized in favor of further deterring China. Um, you know, certainly from our perspective, we believe that Ukraine, the defense of Ukraine plays a critical part in the defense of democracy anywhere, and therefore Taiwan is included in that. But I guess in a finite resource constrained environment, certainly hard choices have to be made. Um, now, I think ultimately um, we have to understand though that deterring China, particularly across the Taiwan Strait, the main responsibility is us. I mean, it's the, the, the U.S. plays extremely helpful and critical part in that, but 
we have our own agency in that, and we have our own responsibilities here. And whether it's President Tsai Ing-wen, who has essentially doubled our defense budget in the past eight years, to you know, President like Lai Xinu, who has con who has promised to pledge to continue uh, our defense spending increases. I mean, we have to do more for our own defense because those are the critical words, our own defense. Do you feel the same is happening in the Philippines? They're also putting more resources into their defense. Well, absolutely. I mean, the Philippines comes from a much lower bar. I mean, they've, they've had a, a lot of defense divestments in past years. I mean, so has Japan. But I think countries here in the Indo-Pacific that realize that um, without actually doing more for their own defense, we're going to lose their sovereignty are starting to wake up to that fact. And so I fully expect that, I mean, we see it here in uh, Taiwan, but also Japan, South Korea, but I think that the Philippines, we're going to probably see a massive, massive investment in their own defense capabilities in coming years. Um, if anything, just to ensure that there are sovereign uh, rights or claims in the South China Sea. Bill, what do you think? Do you feel that the U.S. can resolve this, given that countries here are actually beefing up their own self-defenses? I'm very concerned about the upcoming election in the United States because it's quite clear from comments that uh, that uh, former President uh, Trump has made that he's not very interested in sort of maintaining, supporting the liberal world order um, and therefore not particularly keen on supporting countries like Ukraine under attack or for that matter uh, we know he's never been all that keen about doing anything for Taiwan. Thank you very much, Vincent and Bill, for your insights. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.